Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. And it is Tuesday, November 23rd, 2021. Got started a couple minutes late. Sorry about that. Good to see folks joining on the stream. Good morning, Lyle. Good to see you. And others who are and who will be joining on the stream. All right. We are ready today for Ezekiel chapters 25 through 28. And, uh, well, I'm looking here at my notifications. Hey, there's Gail and Sarah and Garrett. Yeah, the kids are out of school. Good to see you guys. Okay, I've cross-posted to the Near Church's page, and I'm just now getting the notification. So I opened up. It, it did it again. I don't know what's going on. It's so weird, but I opened up again today to start going, start streaming, and there was no camera. That's always fun to deal with, with about 30 seconds until it's time to go. But here we are. Good morning, Diana. Good morning, Brian. <clears throat> like I said, we are in ready for Ezekiel 25 through 28. And as always, if you have any questions or comments while we're going, please feel free to use the comment section and I will address them when I see them. Okay, so the reason I want to do four chapters... Now my phone's not turned down. <laughs> four chapters I know is a lot to cover. But the reason I want to do that is because Ezekiel shifts... Well, God, through Ezekiel, shifts focus from Jerusalem and Judah specifically to the nations that surround them. So, for instance, when you start reading in 25, you're going to see that four nations are addressed... And then chapters 26 through 28 specifically address the nation of Tyre. So we're not going to read every verse throughout all four of these chapters. We're just going to hit the, hit the points of what's being addressed here. And we have to keep in mind the political background, the historical setting of everything that's going on. And of course, that is uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians are the, the dominant world empire. And they are in the process of, well occupation and occupying many different lands and taking captives back, back to Babylon for their own personal uh, political benefit. It's, so the point being, it's not just Judah. It's not just Jerusalem that's being impacted by what uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians are doing. It's a lot of people. And so as you read chapter 25, verses 1 through 7 talk to us about the fact that the Ammonites are going to suffer because the Ammonites... These, so the people here in Ezekiel 25, Ammon, verses 1 through 7, Moab, verses 8 through 11, Edom, verses 12 through 14, and then Philistia, verses 15 through 17, all of these people border Judah. Okay, so Edom, Ammon, and Moab, they're all on the basically on the eastern side of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea, um, right across and then, and, and then a bit south of the Promised Land, let's say. Philistia is south and over on the border of the Mediterranean Sea. So all of these people, hey Shirley, um, all of these people are going to be impacted by what Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians are doing. And this is not an overnight process. This takes years for all of this to, uh, to be fulfilled, to be realized, let's say. <clears throat> But all of these different people are going to be impacted. And it, it's good to know the connections. For instance, Ammon and Moab. Okay, these are the descendants of Lot. Uh, Moab was the firstborn of Lot's eldest daughter. And then Ammon was the second child by Lot's other daughter. Well, they were... Lot was Abraham's nephew. So, I guess you'd say in a distant way, the Ammonites and the Moabites are related to the Israelites, to Judah, and to, to Jerusalem. All right, well, then you have Edom beginning in verse 12. Well, the Edomites, they're descendants of Esau, who was the brother of Jacob, who is Israel, or who became the nation of Israel. So all of these people essentially are connected throughout history. All right, and that's important to know. Good morning, Miss Louise. So you can read in Genesis, the end of Genesis 19 about Ammon and Moab. You can go to uh, Genesis 25 and read about the birth of Jacob and Esau. Well, then Philistia, of course, the Philistines, they've been a, a long time 
enemy of God's people. And, but they're all in the same region, geographically speaking, and Babylon is not choosing favorites, okay? They're taking over everybody. So all of these groups of people are going to be um, captured. Let's use that word. The, the reason stated for these captures here is, well, pride, but also in the fact that these, these nations that surrounded Jerusalem and Judah, when they saw the downfall of, of Israel, of God's people, they rejoiced in that. And so that's what's addressed here, particularly, particularly in chapter 25, is one of the reasons you're being destroyed is, uh, for instance, chapter 25 here and verse, verses 2 and 3 uh, set your son of man, set your face against the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Say to the Ammonites, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, because you said, aha, against my sanctuary when it was profaned and against the land of Israel. So they were, re, these surrounding nations were rejoicing in the fact that God's people were falling. And well, you're going to be judged. So there, there are several verses, particularly in the Proverbs that talk about this idea of you better be careful when your enemy falls. Because if you rejoice in that, you're essentially you're just as guilty as the one who caused the fall. Not it's not good to rejoice when your enemy is defeated or when your enemy suffers. You don't want to be that type of person. So, like you could look at Proverbs 17 and verse 5, or Proverbs 24 verses 17 and 18. They talk about that, about your attitude towards those that suffer. Same thing about Moab, and the same thing about the Edomites. Well, Philistia, like I said here at the end of chapter 25, they'd historically, they've been a long time enemy of God's people. Well, they're going to be in, in, engulfed by the Babylonians too because they're right there in the same region. So that's chapter 25. Chapters 26 through 28 specifically address Tyre, okay? Now Tyre was, so these other nations that we just mentioned are again east and south of the promised land. Tyre is up north on the Mediterranean Sea. It's a major seaport, uh, very prosperous and wealthy. You know, had had uh, uh, economic connections with people all over the place. Be, being a seaport in the Mediterranean Sea, a lot of trade, a lot of commerce, um, human trafficking, okay, slavery, that even comes out in the text. They're going to fall too to the Babylonians. And some very specific prophecies are given here about the nation of Tyre. And so, well, it starts off the same way as chapter 25. If you look at chapter 26, because Tyre said against Jerusalem, aha, she is broken. Well, so they rejoiced in the fall of their enemies. That's one of the reasons that Tyre was going to fall too. But notice there's something interesting here. So Nebuchadnezzar is doing all of this, okay? And it goes on for for about 15 years as he's taking over this whole region. You know, the final attack or assault on Jerusalem was 586 B.C., but really until about 570 or so B.C., he's conquering these other lands around Jerusalem and Judah. <clears throat> and so as he's talking about the destruction of Tyre, notice in 26 and verse 3, he says, O Tyre, uh, I am against you, O Tyre, and will cause many nations to come up against you as the sea causes its waves to come up. So Tyre, it's not going to be wiped out in one swoop, uh, in one moment of time. It's going to be like waves of the sea. It's going, to keep, it's going to keep rolling up on them. And so history actually records that for us from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, which is the 6th century B.C. Ultimately, they fell um, to Alexander the Great in about 332 B.C., he, uh, so there, there are two parts of Tyre, and you can do some Googling, a little bit of research on this. Tyre had a mainland city, let's say, that was, that was on you know, east of the Mediterranean, but they also then had an island about a half mile out into the Mediterranean Sea, and that was like a fortified, uh, you know, very, a very good stronghold. And they thought, well, you know, we'll never be conquered. <laughs> well, what Alexander the Great did was... He destroyed the mainland city, and then he took the, basically he took the debris from that destruction and built a, what's the word? Well, he built a road 
from the mainland out to that island about a half a mile long, and then he conquered the island city. So when, when it says here in, in Ezekiel 26 and verse 3 that this destruction is going to come up like waves of the sea, well, it's going to happen over time. Yeah, Babylon would do what they did, but ultimately it's going to take some time. And, and ultimately, uh, well, n so notice here in verse 4, uh, when it does fall, it says that, that she, Tyre, would be made like the top of a rock. She's going to be scraped clean. Well, again, history kind of shows us that that's what Alexander the Great did. He, he took all of the rubble, all of the debris, and built that road out to the island city, and that's how he conquered them. But you notice that God's doing all this. Okay, God is using the nations uh, at his will. Now, beginning in verse 7, he says, I'll bring from the north, he's going to bring Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses and chariots and all of this. Well, to the mainland city, okay, that would be one thing. You could be surrounded and defeated, but then this island city, well, it's safe. You know, we're half mile, we're half mile from the mainland, we're an island, everything's going to be okay. Not so. So anyway, um... And notice this, again, the specificity of this prophecy, how this is going to happen over time, how it's going to be trampled and destroyed. But notice in Ezekiel 26 and verse 12, they will plunder your riches and pillage your merchandise. They will break down your, listen, break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. They will lay your stones, your timber, and your soil in the midst of the water. That's descriptive of what they would do with that rubble to build that road out to the island. That is so... You know, one of, the, one of the strongest evidences of the inspiration of the Bible is predictive prophecy. And that's what we see happening here. Um, it's, well, and, and then you skip down to verse 19. It says, For thus says the Lord God, When I make you desolate, a, a desolate city like cities that are not re, uh, inhabited, when I bring the deep upon you and great waters cover you, so there's that imagery again of like waves of the sea. It's not going to happen all in one event. It's going to, going to be done over a period of time and by different people. And so uh, they fell to Babylon. Tyre fell to Babylon in 573. Well, obviously then, about 240 years later is when Alexander the Great and the Grecians come in. They wipe the mainland city clean, and they use all that rubble to go out to the, to the island city and capture it. So then chapter 27 is a lamentation for Tyre. Um, you look at verse 2 there. Now, son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyre and say to Tyre, you who are situated at the entrance of the sea, merchant of the peoples on many coastlands. And that's what I was saying earlier. It's a wealthy city. It's a center of commerce. People go there to get things and to bring things to trade. Okay, commerce. All right. Well, so what chapter 27 does is address the fact that, okay, when you collapse... That's all going to be done, and a lot of other people are going to be affected by that. So we're not going to read all of chapter 27, but I did want to point this out. Um, chapter 27, looking down at verse 12, Tarshish was your merchant because, you, because of your many luxuries. Um, they gave you silver, iron, tin, and lead for your goods. Javan, Tubal, Meshech were your tr uh, traders. So again, actively commercial. But notice, they bartered human lives and vessels of bronze for your merchandise. So you've got obvious commerce, trading goods and minerals, but you also have slave trade going on here. And, um, well, God doesn't, he doesn't look well upon that, let's say. He, uh, he has little tolerance for, <laughs> for that type of treatment of humans. So that's all of chapter 27, that lamentation of Tyre, the um, commercial implications of their destruction, how it would affect other people. But notice this also in chapter 27, um, verse 32, talking about the other nations wailing. In their wailing for you, they will take up a lamentation and lament for you. What city is like Tyre? Look, look at this, destroyed in the midst of the sea. Again, that's prophetic because that didn't happen in Nebuchadnezzar's day. That happened 250 years later under Alexander the Great. So those little clues throughout the text keep catching your attention. Hey, Anna, good to see you. 
Well, then chapter 28 is a lamentation of the king of Tyre. All right. Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre. Well, you then read through that uh, down through verse 19, and uh, you see that, and you see a bit of sarcasm in this. Look, beginning in verse 2 here. Because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a god. I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not a god. Though you set your heart as the heart of a god, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. So there's your sarcasm, and there's Daniel mentioned again in the biblical text. <clears throat> Remember, Daniel was credited with, credited with having the spirit of the gods within him. That's how the Babylonians looked at him. Um, you know, they were polytheistic, and, well, the, the, the image or the sarcasm used here is Tyre thought that they were wiser than Daniel. Well, that's obviously sarcastic. But um, that goes on for a bit. Well, you get down to verse 6. Because you have set your heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations. They're going to bring you down to the pit. Verse 8. You're going to be brought down. And that's how God, historically, you read throughout the Bible, that's how God has dealt with nations. He, he, he doesn't tolerate pride. He does not tolerate like human trafficking and things like this. And those, those nations who practice those things will be brought down. Now, here's an interesting thing, here's an interesting thing, that, thing that happens with Ezekiel 28. When you start reading in verse 11, there's quite a description of the prince or the king of Tyre. Um, I'm not going to read all of this, but just notice. You were in the Eden, in the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. And he lists the, the precious stones. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. So some people take Ezekiel 28 in verses 11 through uh, basically verse 19. And they say, well, that's describing Satan. Hello, Sheila. Late but here. Well, that's okay. Uh, Ezekiel 25, I'm sorry, 28, 11 through 19 is not describing Satan in some pre-creation condition. The text tells us precisely who he's talking about. Tells us that in verse 12, and um, it, it's beyond question. But this is kind of like what people do when you go back to, uh, what is it, Isaiah? I think it's Isaiah chapter, yeah, Isaiah chapter 14, and talking about the fall of the king of Babylon. And well, the king of Babylon is referred to as Lucifer. Well, people think that Satan is Lucifer, and Isaiah 14 is talking about Satan, and it's not. Well, people do that same thing with Ezekiel 28 and this description of the king of Tyre. All that's being described here in the language that's used, that he was in the garden and surrounded by stones, is talking about his commerce. He's, he's wealthy, very powerful. Again, Tyre was a center of trade, but it's all going to be brought to an end. So, you know, it's, it's, you got to be careful. You can't pull verses out of context to make them say something they're not saying at all. And it bothers me when people do that. Um, well, it bothers me when people do that, <laughs> when we take things out of context. It's talking about the king of Tyre, not Satan. But then you keep reading in chapter 20. And you get down, or chapter 28, and you get down to verse 20, and now there's a proclamation against Sidon. So think about this. We've got Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, and Sidon. So Tyre and Sidon are basically neighbor cities on the Mediterranean Sea, north of the Promised Land. This entire region is going to be uh, overrun by the Babylonians. So chapter 28, verses 20 through uh, 24, talks about the destruction of of Sidon. They would be judged by God. And then in the midst of all that, as I've talked about throughout the book of Ezekiel, you have all of this doom and judgment and suffering and punishment, and then you have restoration talked about, okay? So he's talked about all these surrounding nations, but then you get to Ezekiel 28 and verse 25. When I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered, well, that would be the Chaldeans. That would be the Babylonians. They're going to be gathered back from that and am hallowed in them in the sight of the Gentiles. Then they will dwell in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob. That's Ezra and Nehemiah. 
That's the decree of Cyrus, okay? That's where 2 Chronicles 36 ends. Babylon was overtaken by the Persian Empire, and Cyrus permitted all the Jews who desired, they could go back to Jerusalem, rebuild their temple, and rebuild the city. And, and Persia financed that. And so that's what we're talking about here. So you have a message of hope for God's people, even in the midst of this lengthy discussion of the judgment of the surrounding nations. They will dwell safely there, build houses and plant vineyards. Um, yes, they will dwell securely when I execute judgments, listen, on all those around them who despise them. Well, that's what he's just been talking about in chapters 25 through 28. Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, and Sidon. That's what we're talking about here. Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God. Hey, Miss Barbara. Good morning. So that's Ezekiel chapters 25 through 28. And that's one of the interesting things about all the prophets. They, their, I would say their main task was to address God's people in their day about their issues. But they also address the surrounding nations like we've read here in these four chapters. Now, when we come back, Lord willing, next Monday, we're not going to do any more streaming this week. We're going to start in 29 and probably just go do like we did today on Monday, do 29 to 32 and address uh, Egypt because that's what chapters 29 through 32 does. So Ezekiel 25 through 32 is God's judgment on the surrounding nations. All right, guys, I don't see any questions or comments in the stream, just a bunch of greetings and always appreciate that. Well, thank you, Lyle. Hope you all have a good Thanksgiving and, uh, all the rest of you, too. We will be here tomorrow night at 7 p.m., our Bible class. We're going to be looking at Psalms 20 and 21. 20 and 21. Yeah, because 22, Psalm 22 is pretty lengthy, and it's one of those messianic psalms. So anyway, if you're not able to get out tomorrow night or under the weather or something like that, you can, you'll have the ability to join on our live stream here and study through Psalm chapters 20 and 21. All right, guys. Thank you, Sheila. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. Hope you all have a good rest of this week and a good holiday with your family. Everybody be safe if you're traveling. And hopefully we'll see you back here next week and we'll get back to it.